Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our first Museum of Deaf History, Arts and Culture, which we also call MDHAC, our first virtual event for the year. I'm your host this evening. My name is Suzanne Dennis. People often call me Suze. I'm one of the vice presidents on the board of the museum and responsible for programs. First, I'd like to start with a little housekeeping. Those of you who want access to tonight's program via captioning, make sure that you click the button for auto-generated captioning. We do have spoken English interpretation this evening that will be uh, feeding the auto-generated captioning, and we hope that that's successful. I'd first of all like to explain about our event. Boo Brew was first uh, originated years ago, and we would always host it at a restaurant with a silent auction. It was very interactive and social. We would always have the event with our local Sertoma group. And that was because the Kansas School for the Deaf would benefit from the fundraising. There were the, we have a youth DeVia program. And Sertoma, uh, our local chapter, closed. But we took the reins and continued with those fundraising efforts. We want to keep the vision alive. So as I said, this event typically is hosted in person with a speaker, uh, beer and a silent auction. And this year, Obviously, with COVID, we are um, going to take a different approach, and I hope everybody's safe, by the way. Uh, so we had to be creative this year and decided to host our verse, first virtual event. So why not? We'll just do something a little differently. So this year, the event is free of charge. There's no entrance fee, of course, but we do hope that many of you will consider making a donation to the museum or even becoming a friend of the museum. Our presentation this evening has two people joining us this evening. We're going to open first with Mark Burke, who is one of the owners of Streetcar 82. And uh, Streetcar 82 is located in Maryland. Mark is joining me here on screen. And then our second presenter is LaDonna Snyder. And she's representing the Kansas School of the Deaf. She is our coordinator for the Youth DeVia uh, program. So she'll come after Mark. First, I'd like to welcome Mark. We're thrilled to have you. And Mark's saying, thank you so much, Suze, for having me be a part of this event. It's very exciting to um, be a part of this and, and also show my support for Deaf Art. So it's great to uh, be here with you all this evening. And I'd like to start by saying, you know, beer is an art. It's something that I enjoy uh, very much so as an art form. So I'm here this evening to talk specifically about the language of beer. I'd like to give everybody an idea about the history of beer to start with. It goes way back, 7 to 7,000 BC. And it actually started historically with women. And Sue says, Oh, I'm not surprised. And now we're entering Halloween and we see often reference to witch's brew. You may wonder where that came from. And if you think about it, before people fully understood science, ingredients would be put into a big container, right? grains that would be used for cereals, water, 
just a number of ingredients would be brewed, right? And you you can imagine the, the black cauldron with the broomstick stirring that brew. That was passed on for generations. They thought that would be made that would make beer, but actually that stick, that broomstick that was um, used to stir created yeast. Bacteria was brought in and that created yeast and sugar was fed into it and that became beer. So what later was discovered was that yeast was a critical ingredient to becoming, uh, to making beer. There are four main ingredients today that are a part of beer. That's water, malt or grain, for example, wheat, barley, rye, perhaps oats. And then we have hops, which is a, a green sort of um, item that has a very floral, spicy, fruity note, right? There's actually a variety of types of hops. And then the fourth and final ingredient is yeast. And different yeasts will be used for different flavor notes as well. Some beers will also have an additive of some certain type of flavor. Uh, it might be chocolate or fruity flavors, maybe strawberry. Uh, right now, a sour is very popular. So some sort of sour fruit is added to make a fifth ingredient. So here at Streetcar 82, which um, in our community, we sign it by signing the letter S in 82. Uh, we have been doing very well since we've opened. And with COVID, we are still making beer. People still want to purchase our um, beer and take it home. So our business is um, thriving continually. I'd like to tell you a little bit about where our name came from. Several years ago, we looked into the history of this area and uh, car lines, streetcar lines used to be very important to this, this community. So our research, we found a YouTube video of a street, of a car line that went through this very neighborhood. And I shared it with the uh, two, my two business partners, right? The three of us were talking about owing, opening a brewery together. So I sent this YouTube video to my business partners and we had even more cool discoveries. At the beginning of that line, that line would pass John's home first, right? And then it would go to the next uh, business partner, Sam, his home. It would pass his home. Then it would pass the brewery location and end up near my home. So we felt like this was just a connection of all three of us and the location of our brewery. We were just like, how cool is that? It felt uh, just sort of, you know, it, it just felt meant to be. So we had to name it Streetcar 82 and show our pride and show, um, I don't know, it could just reflect our connection to this location and community. It has been such a fun journey. All right, so I'd like to give the audience an opportunity to ask questions or, um, I mean, really, I'd like to uh, share information that the audience would like to know. So are there any questions? And Suzanne says, yeah, I see one audience question. And they're saying, when you add flavors into a beer, is it an extract or is it the actual fruit? that is added. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about that? So that, you know, because I would wonder if the fruit became spoiled. So that's from the audience. And Mark's answer is, now in a home brew situation, it, it might be different. They might use um, extract or they might use a grain. So for example, at somebody's home, think about making a cake. You buy a cake mix 
And then you add ingredients like butter or some sort of oil and you mix the ingredients and then you bake it. And that's called an extract kit, right? It's all ready for you. But if you make something from scratch, that would be a different process. So you would have each separate ingredient. You would have sugar. You would have baking soda. You would have flour. You would have each individual ingredient, right? But the extract kit is easier to make. It's more convenient. Everything is already combined for you. However, with an extract kit, you don't have as much uh, freedom to change the flavors. If you make something from scratch, you have more control over how it comes out. You also, though, have much more room for error. So you have to sort of weigh the two, right? There's pros and cons to both. So in homebrew, where there's extract kits, uh, you have less room for error, but you also have less control. A lot of people start with that experience until they get to an experience with all grain. Uh, here, we use all grains. So we make every, all of our beers from scratch uh, in, from the entire process. Like I said earlier, there's the four ingredients, water, grains, hops, and yeast. And we design individual recipes. We start by thinking about the type of beer. Maybe it's an IPA. And we start thinking about the types of flavors we want, notes. So we, we prepare the yeast. And um, I mean, like I said, beer is an art form, right? Like, like food is an art form. And a chef uh, has their freedom to design certain dishes. We as brewers have the same way. And the more experience you have in a kitchen, you become a more experienced chef. The same is true for me uh, or other brewers. The more experience we have brewing, the more uh, experience we have in creativity and, and understanding how to change flavors. Uh, it's, it's just a, a lot of people think that it is fun, right? It's like having a vacation, right? Like my job is vacation. But honestly, there's a lot of cleaning that has to do with this work. So it's almost like I would say 90% of beer making is cleanup. 10% is the actual making of the brew. Uh, I mean, so much of our time is spent on cleaning and cleanup. If you don't clean out uh, the brew system, if you don't clean out the tanks, the beer is going to taste horrible. You're going to ruin your entire batch of brew. So I can't emphasize enough how important cleaning is. Sanitation is a critical part of our process. And you'll see behind me the stainless steel vats. Um, stainless steel is, is an important material that we use. We have four tanks here and we do use chemicals to sanitize that are, you know, dangerous. Uh, we use hot water, we use acids, sanitizer. I mean, there's there are a number of chemicals that we are required to use and have to use to keep the beer, um, you know, keep the integrity of each batch. And Suzanne says, I think there's another question here. And it's asking you to expand on lager and ale and the difference between the two. And Mark says, yes. So often people confuse the two. So uh, lager and ales are both types of beer. And the main difference is the type of yeast that is used. Ale is fermented at a warmer temperature, maybe room temperature. So I would say 65 to 70 degrees. While, and it depends on the type of yeast, but yeast in ales tend to have a more complex flavor. Whereas lagers ferment at a colder temperature. So that's more like 50 degrees. And it takes longer to brew, longer to make. 
they usually end in a more crisp flavor. So those, that's a little bit of the difference. And Suzanne is asking, is one of them healthier than the other? And Mark's response is no. Ales from brew day to tap probably take 10 days. While a lager, that process takes much longer, uh, possibly five to six weeks. And again, that's because of the type of yeast and that it takes a longer process because it ferments at a lower temperature. People often assume that lagers are actually easier to make because they're more simple. However, that's not the case. The process of brewing a lager leaves more room for error. You can't hide the flaws in a lager as well as you can in ale because ale has more complex flavor uh, than that um, creates a difference there. So Suzanne is asking, because the processes are so different, are the prices also different uh, as a reflection of a process being more complex? And Mark's saying, I don't up the price on loggers that we sell, no, because the amount of yeast is less, And some of our beers, we do bump up the price, but that is a result of perhaps the type of hops. So maybe the hops price, uh, market price is very high. So there's a type of ho hops right now called mosaic hops, and that's very pricey. So then our price of beer would be reflected in that. Um, we also uh, charge for, um, you know, different types of beer, depending on the ingredients and if we might have to pay more for those ingredients. And Suzanne saying we do have some audience questions coming in. One of the ones that I see here is, um, are you able to purchase beers online and do you ship beer? Mark saying, well, we make our beer in the state of Maryland and we are not able to ship our beer out of state. It is not allowed. How it is set up is we have a very small brewery. Most of our beers are sold directly here. Our distribution is limited to local businesses only. We like to say to people, if you want our beer, you got to come to Maryland. And the reason is you also got to get the streetcar 82 experience, right? You, you got to taste the beer here. We don't want you to get our beer off the shelf because then you miss the experience of streetcar 82. We want you to be here to experience our beer. And Suzanne is saying, well, I hope you'll see me there someday. That's on my plan. We have one more question on, uh, from the audience, and I'd uh, like to take a minute and, and look at the question before I get, pose it to you. So this question says, I like a light tasting wheat. And what does that mean in the beer world if I say a light tasting wheat? For example, does it have a low amount of hops or is it a different type of yeast that's used? And the, the response is, for so many um, beers, there's so many styles, right? And there are so many styles of yeast. So it depends on if you like light beers, like a wheat beer, then maybe like a a Belgian wheat or a Hefeweizen beer, a German Hefeweizen, or perhaps a, an American wheat. That does depend on the type of yeast that is sort of matched with that type of beer. A light wheat tends to have a low amount of hops because that doesn't make it bitter right? However, right now, the trend today is uh, 
brewers are pushing their limits and, see, and experimenting and seeing how hoppy they can get, right? How much of a, of a hop they can add. Or for example, right now, IPAs are very popular. So wheat is sometimes used in IPAs. So there's a lot of experimentation that happens. And, you know, it's it you truly have a blank canvas when you decide what type of brew i mean you just got to get in there and play to figure out what works and what doesn't right years ago we kind of had we had budweiser miller miller light right you knew they had to be cold well today the variety of beers and variety of flavors and temperatures are endless Right. I mean, and it always breaks my heart when people say they don't like beer and I will say, oh, you haven't found the right one yet. Then there's a beer for everyone. If you don't like lager, maybe you'll like a sour or maybe you'll like a stout. I truly believe there is a beer for for everyone. I mean, it's just there are so many different flavor notes. And Suzanne is saying, I've always wondered about that. OK, we have another question. And that question is, do you have a preference of making wheat or hops or hops over wheat? Do you have a preference? And if so, why? Mark's response. Well, all of our beer has hops. Hops is one of those four basic ingredients. Having said that, wheat is one of the different grains we use, right? And one of the different malts we use. We use a base malt, but we also use wheat to supplement beer, or we use oats or barley sometimes. Sometimes it's rye, or sometimes it's a mix of all of those grains. There's also a, a, a malt that's more dark colored that gives flavor, right? Uh, sometimes you will see beer that's straw colored. That's with a lighter malt. If you use a, a darker malt, the, the beer is going to be darker. So there's all types of different malts also. Uh, it seems like a new malt variety is, is being invented every day. So like I've said, brewing is an art and it's, it, it's just um, an art form that continues to be explored. As Suzanne is saying, I'm just really impressed with how much creativity comes into it, right? That's it's like no one beer is going to have the same recipe. So, Mark, the the three of you, the three of you that are owners uh, for this brewery, do you have sp uh, any specific education or certificates? Is there a required background that would uh, be necessary? And Mark's saying, you know, I worked in the school system many years before I came to the brewing business. I worked as an athletic director and left the school system and decided to just start a new career. And what I decided to do was open a brewery with some of my friends. So that was the three of us, the, the other two guys that I mentioned. And we, we've just made a perfect team. I think for I focus on the production or brewing part. John focuses on operations and Sam takes care of the bookkeeping. So it works out very nicely for the three of us. I can focus my entire energy on productions, right? If I had to work on all aspects of the business, I would pull my hair out. I don't have any degrees or certificates in Brewing. I was a home brewer for many years before this venture. I always enjoyed making home brews and sharing it with my friends. And people would always urge me to open a brewery. I was resistant for many years until a good friend of mine, who is a Gallaudet professor, um, actually mentioned the idea of me opening a brewery. And that just got me thinking. Uh, the next week, uh, there was an, an opportunity to do a business pitch and, and they said to me, you have a chance to win $3,000 if you win this business pitch. So I, it got me thinking. I talked with my wife about it and we thought, well, what does it hurt to try? So we, um, 
we proceeded to come up with a business pitch. It was a three, it was limited to three minutes. We had to do this pitch within three minutes, minutes for, for our new business. And we ended up not winning at that time. But what happened is we won audience's preference. So what we got was $250. That became our seed money. That business pitch also, what it did was it brought community together. The audience saw my pitch and it it got community going. One of the judges on the panel, uh, it was a very successful businessman in the D.C. area. And, you know, I approached him afterwards and gave him uh, one of our beers and said, we're going to open up. And at that time, you know, we had just started Um, we just put, you know, a quick little business plan together uh, that was just sort of, you know, put together on a napkin. Uh, We didn't have anything formal. So that's all we had at the time. And, you know, when people say they want to open a business, I say, just start, just do it. One quote that I took seriously was, if you believe you can, you're halfway there. That's just become a quote that I live by, right? If you believe you can, you're halfway there. And I believed I could. We're now open. Suzanne saying, well, congratulations on such a wonderful journey. Uh, we do have two more questions. And uh, I think at that point, we'll wrap up to move on with our program. So the next question is when you say beer, when you describe beer as being hoppy, what does that really mean? Is it more bitter or does it have a lighter flavor? Could you tell us what it means when a beer is described as being hoppy? Mark's response is, you know, it's confusing to say that because it's difficult to, um, and it's difficult to show you because we're on this virtual uh, way of delivery, but Hops is a green plant. And if you Google it, you can see images, but they have different flavor notes. It can be fruity, spicy, tropical, uh, even minty. And so when we describe beer as being hoppy, it's more about the amount of hops that are used. And the more hops you use, the more flavorful it will be. If you want a very high ABV, then there needs to be more malt grains added to the beer. So the amount of malt grains will actually increase the ABV. Hops is more of the flavoring and bittering or aroma. So that's the the short of it. It it can be fairly confusing, especially without you being here to actually taste, right? I would say the most hoppy beer is an IPA. Uh, Yeah, an IPA is more hoppy than most. Suzanne is saying, all right, well, then great. Uh, The last question we have is, let me take a look. So this question is, how did Mark and the others learn to brew? How did you learn to brew in the first place? And the response is, I mentioned earlier that I was a home brewer. That's how I started out. So I started out with making five gallon batches. When we decided to open a brewery, that was, you know, a, a much different picture. Th- that, that was a huge upgrade, right? Uh, you're making much more than five gallons. So at that time, I visited a number of local breweries and found them to be very supportive and very transparent. So they invited me into their breweries. I could shadow. So there was one particular brewer that allowed me to shadow him and he showed me everything about the business. I um, asked questions and uh, he he often would say, you know what, Mark, you're going to figure it out just like you did at your homebrew. You would have a problem come up and you would figure it out. That's what you do in your business. 
So, of course, I was very nervous when we started this venture, right? I mean, it takes money to start a business and we had about a, a certain amount of money into it. So I was nervous, but I also was confident because I had so much support. And once the process started, we ran into some issues, absolutely. And when we did, we would reach out for advice, reach out for tips. And the more I continued and, and moved forward, the more I understood, right? I know so much more now than I did two years ago. And how I have learned that is just through experience. It's good old fashioned experience. I mean, just like cooking, right? You just start small and you keep cooking and keep experimenting. It's the same thing with brewing beer. Suzanne is saying it's the same as art too, right? As you develop your artistic skills, you start to experiment with different mediums and artistic abilities. Absolutely, Mark's saying. Well, this is Suzanne. Thank you for your expertise and being with us to share your journey. It truly is a language of beer, right? Uh, you also have the art of beer. And a nice thing is beer becomes a, a, a language uh, barrier breaker, right? It brings people together. Uh, deaf people, hearing people, regardless of their, their knowledge of sign language. So it's, it just brings um, a wonderful community together. Well, I do hope that I will visit uh, Streetcar 82 someday. And thank you again for participating with us in tonight's event. We truly appreciate it. Mark saying thank you for inviting me and I'm thrilled to support Davia Art. I want to see that movement grow. So thank you very much. Good night, Mark. Suzanne here. Wow, what a great start to our event. Um, I think that er makes, inspires me to feel more adventurous with beer tasting uh, and even getting information about vocabulary about the beer and terminology. So I hope you've been inspired as well. So I'd like to um, share a little bit more information about our museum. We have been involved with the youth art competition, and it's been made possible with a lot of support through donations, friends of the museum, sponsors, and partners. So again, please do consider making a donation to our museum through our Facebook link. You can find the URL for our webs website and you can find a text to donate feature. So you can text MDHAC to 44-321. You can donate that way. And you will find those instructions on our Facebook feed. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our second presenter, LaDonna Snyder. And LaDonna is the coordinator of the Youth Devia Competition, which is a national competition. She also works as staff at the Kansas School for the Deaf, uh, KSD. She's a museum volunteer as well and has a long history of collaborating. The KSD and museum have a long history of collaborating and work together. And those of you who don't know, the museum and Kansas School for the Deaf are actually right across the street from each other. So it creates a lot of opportunities for uh, interaction, collaboration, and support, which we truly value. Uh, and I'd like to give a shout out to Chris Daly who is president of our museum. And also a shout out to the superintendent of KSD, Luann Barron. So uh, just really want to uh, thank both of them for keeping our partnership alive and thriving. LaDonna, join me on screen here. Hi, LaDonna. Hello, Suze. All right, well, we look forward to your presentation and learning about the winners of this competition. Yes, great. So, first of all, 
the 2020 youth competition um, is one I was coordinator for. I'm LaDonna, Sli LaDonna Snyder. And I, I would like to um, first, oh, whoops, let's get your slides showing here. Hold on one second, LaDonna. Okay, so now, now the slides are showing. Okay, go ahead and, and um, start. We're on the first slide. Okay. All right, so I'm going to start over. So we have the 2020 Davia Youth Competition. My name is LaDonna Snyder. And I'm coordinator uh, and have been for a long time. So our second slide now, I want to make sure that's what's being projected. Okay, so we have Chuck Baird pictured on this slide. And Chuck is an American deaf artist, uh, very notable in our uh, Davia movement, and is one of the founders of uh, Davia and the movement in the United States. He has created many visual art pieces that convey the deaf worldview. Chuck Baird, for 35 years, had a career of painting, sculpting, acting, uh, storytelling, and teaching. He grew up right in our backyard in Kansas City, Kansas, and is an, a proud alum, was a proud alumni of KSD. He graduated in 1967 from the Kansas School from the, for the Deaf. And I'd like to um, talk about DEVIA and what it actually stands for. And just pausing here for a moment to make sure my presentation is projecting correctly. Suzanne saying, okay, just keep going, LaDonna. Okay, so what is DEVIA? The first two letters, D-E, stand for deaf. The V stands for visual. I for image, and A for arts. So it's sort of an acronym that we call DEVIA. Next slide. So I'd like to talk about the origin of our DeVia Youth Competition. It stemmed from eight deaf artists who created a manifesto. They wanted to um, continue the memory and legacy of Chuck Baird and DeVia to our youth, to our deaf youth, so that his legacy would stay alive. The concept started in 2015, and that actually started at KSD before we uh, included other schools and programs throughout the United States. Uh, there were just a few other schools that were um, a part of this work. In 2015, we received about 200 pieces of art, ranging from elementary to high school students. And we got it through snail mail, through postal service. Uh, it was such a, a rich experience. And then in 20, you know, to, to 2020, we started receiving digital type of artwork. So it's become, right, with such better technology, we're able to receive artworks digitally. And today we now have received 448 pieces of art, which is overwhelming, but it's uh, very enjoyable. And um, I'm glad to say I have support uh, in doing this, uh, coordinating this competition. Next slide. 
So Kansas School for the Deaf, like I said, was uh, the place that this concept originated. And you'll notice that the jackrabbit is um, is depicted here and showing the states and schools that are involved in our competition. So you see the jackrabbits that are out there. And I'm going to list the individual schools. So these are who, these are the names of the schools that we invited. Rocky Mountain Deaf School, which is located in Colorado. Phoenix Day School for the Deaf. Texas School for the Deaf, which is located in Austin. Metro School for the Deaf in Minnesota. Wisconsin School for the Deaf. Virginia School for the Deaf and Blind, VSDB. Maryland School for the Deaf, and that's in Columbia. Maryland School for the Deaf, which is located in Frederick. And then we have MSSD, the Model Secondary School for the Deaf in Washington, D.C. Georgia School for the Deaf. WPSD, Western Pennsylvania School for the Deaf. And then finally, oh, oh, and, and WPSD is in uh, Pittsburgh. And then, of course, finally, Kansas School for the Deaf. So what a, a great list of uh, schools that participate. So on our next slide, I'm going to start showing you this year's 2020s uh, pieces that are going to be exhibited in our museum. These are the pieces that were selected by our team of judges and uh, have won in each category. They are going to be uh, displayed in the museum uh, as soon as that is determined to be safe. So we'll start uh, by showing some pieces and, and um, I'll, I'll give some interpretations of the art pieces. So this is uh, the category of grades kindergarten and first grade, first place, the winner's masterpiece. And you see it's called Red Hands. And the artist is from Maryland Deaf School. Our second one is uh, the category of grades four and five. And you see here it's hands for eyes, hands for sign eyes for receptive is what it's titled. Uh, it really demonstrates the value of communication. And this artist is from Metro Deaf School. And then the third piece I'm going to show is from the middle school class category. And the artist is from Wisconsin School for the Deaf. And it's titled The Persistence of Growth. It's such a beautiful piece to see the sign uh, for growth depicted within the art. All right, the next slide I feel is very inspirational. It's the high school category, again, from Wisconsin School of the Deaf. And it's titled, ASL Can Be Fascinating to Children's Eyes. And you just see that demonstrated in the art with the moon in the background and the eyes lighting up. I just love this piece. Uh, I can't wait for it to be in the museum. Suzanne is saying, I'm just amazed at the work that these young artists are able to create. It just makes me excited for what their future holds. LaDawn is saying, yes, the next slide is from a uh, category of grades fourth and fifth. It's entitled In One World from the Virginia School of the Deaf and Blind. And you'll see here the um, hand, ear, mouth, all being depicted. It's just a beautiful uh, sculpture, a beautiful piece. And then the next one uh, where you'll start to see sort of the 
um, placement of Black Lives Matter movement and how that is influencing our youth. And so here we have Black Deaf Woman Power, uh, which is from the model uh, secondary school of the deaf. So that's a beautiful piece. Our next category, grades two and three, where you see um, the, it's titled um, Troy and called 85 because that is sort of a literal translation of a sign that we use to, um, to give this idea of something being amazing or incredible. So now we have from Phoenix Day School for the Deaf, a piece that's titled Question Mark. And um, there's a number of, of cultural, there's just a lot of cultural experience depicted in this piece, which is amazing to think about uh, a child, um, you know, um, having the creativity to e express their thoughts in this artwork. Uh, the next piece that I'm showing depicts the binding of hands and um, and how that the power of um, being bound right uh, is and the oppression. So these are examples of Davia and different artworks that are created by our youth, which is just such an inspiration. And Suzanne is saying. Um, Art, deaf art can be affirming, but it can also be resistant, right? It can show the negative, oppressive experiences that deaf people experience, as well as positive and empowering experiences. So uh, it's, a, it's a powerful educational tool. Absolutely, Suze. And um, this next slide shows the uh, museum and the picture of our museum. That is where the pieces of art that I just showed you will be displayed. And within the building, you see the Chuck Baird Art Gallery. We have opened a gallery honoring Chuck Baird. It's a gorgeous space with um, lighting such that the artwork is displayed beautifully. Um, deaf people can go and visit our museum and be inspired, whereas hearing people can come in and, and begin to understand the richness we have in, uh, in our art. And I think the gallery was open two years ago. There was a grand opening. And Suzanne is saying this was actually Chuck Baird's wish. He has, he's always dreamed of a gallery being opened at this museum in Kansas, uh, across from the deaf school. Um, Unfortunately, he passed away before we were able to accomplish opening this gallery, but all of his communications and emails and writings we looked at and uh, utilized to build and design this gallery. So it's very inspirational. This was the very first project that we um, set upon accomplishing. When people visit our museum, they feel like it's the most teachable area. I mean, there are a number of exhibits in our museum. Um, they're great uh, exhibits, but I think the gallery has an emotional sense that really hits people. It impacts people in a different way. And that's actually what we want to teach. We want people to understand the human humanness and humanity of deaf people, the good and the bad, right? Um, there's a mix of experiences that deaf people have in this world, and we want to highlight that. So we very, we're very grateful for this gallery. Madonna saying the next slide shows the display, the 2019 youth display that was uh, exhibited at the gallery. So you get an idea of, of what our, uh, our exhibit will look like. And then the next slide, we're just giving some thanks um, and want to give a salute to KSD and the museum uh, for commemorating and uh, being the founder of this competition. It's very inspiring, very inspiring. Um, 
I just, I, yeah, I love this, this youth competition and being able to be a part of it this way. So I'd like to thank Kansas School for the Deaf and the Museum of uh, Deaf History, Arts and Culture for their support of this event and honoring Chuck Baird and making sure that his dream has come true. So we're very grateful for the support that continues. And Suzanne is saying, and we appreciate you and what you do. Organization of this event every year is very time consuming. It takes a lot of work. It's very fun, we know, but we appreciate your effort and time in doing this. And I know Chuck Baird appreciates it too from wherever he is. Absolutely. Well, let's take a moment and see if there's any questions from the audience. I'm just going to pause a minute and see if anything comes up in our feed. I see one question. And uh, it seems like it might be a person of a personal nature. So what has inspired this process? And uh, what do you hope to inspire in children? Uh, what might be the most teachable moment for children in being involved in this? LaDonna is saying, I just want everybody to see what is possible. And we wish everybody's piece could be exhibited, right? And even though that can't be, we want everybody to see the pieces that are displayed and be inspired from that and see what is uh, demonstrated in the art in terms of language deprivation and oppression, the number of experiences that we have. And just know that every, that all children, all deaf children have a piece of this. Everybody who submits an art piece will get um, will get a card. They will be able to um, continue their work, their art work. We uh, we will send a framed piece of Chuck's work um, for all of the the students from kindergarten to um, high school. So there are prizes that are a part of this. And we just want to continue to inspire each of the kids. And Suzanne is saying, it's great to inspire them to continue their artwork and um, continue exploring it. We have another question from the audience. And that question is, is um, who are the judges for this event? And LaDonna is saying that is actually confidential. The um, most judges have experience with Davia themselves. They know what is being looked for. Um, and so they have experience in judging. Um, but that is a confidential. Suzanne is saying, great. We have another question from the audience. I'm making sure I understand the question. So the artwork that was submitted and um, chosen is displayed, but what ha what happens with the other pieces that are submitted? Is that um, something that's shown or what happens there? LaDonna is saying you can look on the KSD's webpage, look for Davia winners, and you'll see the photos of um, the works that are that have placed and that have been chosen. So you can look there. We have an agreement with the museum. that the first place pieces will be in the museum, right? Um, and we have limited space. So we have to sort of, um, you know, work within that space. If we ever have an addition, if you expand the building, then perhaps we can have more pieces displayed. Suzanne is saying yes. So um, those are the, the pieces that 
are chosen, but people are able to see other pieces on the website of KSD. That makes sense. Thank you, LaDonna. Um, I don't see any other questions from the audience. So um, if you have any closing comments, um, you might be able to share those at this moment. And LaDonna is saying, just continue to please support all deaf artists and deaf art teachers who work at the deaf schools. You know, it takes a, a, a lot. It takes a lot of patience, creativity and commitment to work with kids and to teach art. And Suzanne saying, yes, absolutely. Those art teachers also carry on that passion and uh, continue to inspire our deaf artists, our deaf youth artists. So thank you, LaDonna, for taking time to participate in our Boo Brew event. Uh, we appreciate it. We appreciate you and all of the work that you do. We really, truly value our relationship with Kansas School for the Deaf. So thank you again. All right, that brings us to the end of our event. I hope you all have enjoyed your time this evening. And before we wrap it up, I uh, want to make sure that we give huge hats off to our IT team that made this program possible. Donnie Jacob, Katie Merch, and Chris Hallmark. And then also our interpreter providing the spoken English interpretation, Stacy Storm. Thank you to all of you for helping make this program possible this evening. I hope everybody has enjoyed yourselves. And again, I hope you will consider becoming a part of our Museum of Deaf History, Arts and Cultural Family. Uh, take a look at our website get on our e-list so that you can stay up with our announcements and events. If you need our website address, it's www.museumofdeaf.org. Again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Have a wonderful evening.